Hello one and all to another Kerbal Space Program video and as you can see in just a second as we zoom in here we are showcasing an absolutely ludicrous aircraft. It has a staggering 2092 pieces and as you can see the Kraken does not always appreciate it so let's try reloading that again. <laughs> This aircraft was created by uh, Reddit user XN0M3 or Zenome, Zenom, I, I think that's how it's meant to be pronounced, I don't know. I ain't really down with the kids these days. There is a link to the Steam Workshop page in the video description for those of you that are, you know, mad enough to uh, want to try this thing for yourself. And you know, you may be tempted watching this footage and thinking, you may be watching it and thinking, wow, KSV must be really well optimised these days, because for a craft of over 2,000 parts, that frame rate is incredible. Unfortunately, while I hate to be the bearer of bad news, I do have bad news to bear. For the approximately 10 minutes of footage you'll be watching in this video, I spent around two hours recording footage for it, to, you know, obtaining the footage. This thing rarely runs above 5 FPS, and I was frequently struggling to keep a consistent one frame per second at certain points. The S may as well stand for session at this point rather than second. I mean mainly for the takeoff. You know the takeoff looked fairly swift just there. Um, for those that look for you watching at home I imagine it took about a minute. I'm trying to see how long I've been talking for so far because it was about that. For me it was about 25-30 minutes to do that takeoff and that's not because I kept on crashing or whatever. That was just 25-30 to 30 minutes for that take you just saw. There, finally the, uh, the graphical glitches have sorted themselves out. But I've wanted to make this uh, video ever since I saw this craft shared on the, uh, the Kerbal Space Program subreddit. It's really amazing. Look at these. Look at these doors with stock hinges and you can actually go inside the fuselage and it's all structurally there. It's amazing. And believe it or not, this is actually based on a real aircraft concept. Never built, funnily enough. But uh, well, well, that's what we're going to be talking about. This aircraft. This aircraft's real life theoretical counterpart and you know the various things that kind of led up to this kind of craft really. Because it was it was my intention to release the final episode of Green Harvest today but it just wasn't quite ready for the release you know you guys but you guys did seem to respond quite well to my last non-Green Harvest video which was also about a ridiculous real life aircraft concept that never materialised so I thought I'd follow suit and show off another American military aircraft idea that never and I will not apologise for this pun, got off the ground. The aircraft carrier is a concept that I'm sure you're all familiar with, a big ship with a runway on its deck that facilitates the launch, recovery and storage for a small air force. However, the term aircraft carrier is not restricted to naval vessels. There have been several efforts to create an airborne aircraft carrier to varying degrees of success. Some systems are usually referred to as parasite aircraft, you know, the actual fighters themselves I'm talking about, wherein a mothership aircraft such as a bomber would have an additional small fighter aircraft either stored in its payload bays or attached to its wings or fuselage and if threatened the bomber can deploy the parasite aircraft to defend against the imminent attack. Not quite what the aircraft in this video is was all about but this is kind of what was building up to it. The first parasite fighters cropped up in the 1910s as small aircraft mounted to the underside of military airships for use in the First World War, but these systems were rarely actually used in combat. And you know, over the following two decades there would be various attempts from several nations to equip their airships with fighter aircraft with many successful flights and operations taking place. However, the ultimate loss of the USA's Akron and Macom Akron and Macon, I don't really know the correct pronunciation there. Uh, that put an end to America's experiments and I guess the UK just sort of lost interest in their own projects I guess. I don't really care too much about the airships because it's too obvious, too boring and I want to talk about the first truly Kerbal attempt at a parasite fight system and that came from the good old Soviet Union in the 1930s. It was called the Zveno. Zveno? There's going to be a lot of me butchering pronunciations in this video, so we just need to accept it and move on with our lives. Anyway, this translates in Russian to chain link, and it consisted not of an airship, but of a Tupolev TB1 or TB3, with between two and five fighter jets struck, not fighter jets, aircraft, we're not on jets just yet, to, uh, two to five aircraft strapped to its wings and fuselage. Depending on the variant, the whole ship could be launched with its fighters attached to it or have them dock to it in mid-flight. And it could even, you know, the parasite fighters could even serve as a means to refuel the bomber itself. There are quite a few different Zveno variants, but the definitive one was the Zveno SPB, and that consisted of a TB3 bomber with two uh, Polykarpov I-16s, each armed with two 550-pound bombs, and it flew several successful missions actually at the start of World War II. It had a 
pretty good run, flying around 30 combat missions during its service, but it was withdrawn from the Air Force in 1942 due to the increasing vulnerability of the TB3 bomber and the I-16 fighters in the face of advancing aircraft technology possessed by the enemy. It was just kind of obsolete through outdated aircraft, really. Nevertheless, the Zvino remains the only real example of a parasitic aircraft concept used successfully in actual warfare. However, as the shining star of this video is evidence too, the concept wasn't dead just yet. Later in the war, the Luftwaffe experimented with the Messerschmitt ME328 being used as a parasitic fighter to protect German bombers, but you know the unstable nature of its pulse jet engine meant that the uh, the whole thing never really got too far as as like a, in terms of a practical fighter jet. The Germans did eventually come up with the Aredo E381, which was a small plane mounted to the belly of a larger AR-234C. But what's cool about this one is that the plane didn't have a propeller or jet engine to power it, but instead this was shot forwards with a rocket motor at high speed towards the target, and after this it would just glide unpowered to the ground to land on its underbelly skids. You know, so pretty Kerbal, I guess. The, there's quite a few good Kerbal concepts within this video, I think. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be talking too much about the history, actually. Maybe I should be dragging this out and being able to make a videos about each of these things. Whatever. Maybe I'll do it in a live stream or something. Who knows? Anyway, uh, while a few wooden airframes for this particular craft and a single mock-up for training pilots was built, the E381 was cancelled due to a lack of funds. The other rocket parasite envisioned by Germany, the Sombold SO344, was slightly different in its design, but it ended up meeting a similar fate. Japan got a little bit further than Germany with its MXY-7 aircraft, which was a rocket plane launched from a bomber. This was presumably more successful than Germany's attempts because the aircraft in question was a kamikaze aircraft, so they didn't really need to figure out how to uh, make it land safely. That wasn't, that wasn't a big concern of the designers. However, the enormous weight of the parasite craft slowed the carrying bombers down to a crawl, making them extremely vulnerable to allied air interception before they could reach the launch zone, making the effectiveness in the war extremely minimal. But let's just fast forward to the 1950s. The Cold War was upon us, so the USA began re-experimenting with parasite aircraft some 20 20 years after their initial testing with airships. This time they would be trying a variety of parasite fighters to protect their Convair B-36 bombers. One of the most famous examples being the uh, unique looking XF-85 Goblin. They also looked into attaching an F-84 in the bomber's bomb bay or attaching it to the wingtips, but uh, one of the more uh, favoured concepts was to uh, use the XF-85 Goblin and have it deploy from one B-36 dash across enemy territory to deploy its freedom bombs or to provide reconnaissance and whatever, and then once clear of enemy lines it would fly back up and hook itself to a different B-36 that was situated on the other side of the rival territory. However, air-to-air -air refueling rendered this concept and eventually the idea of parasite aircraft as a whole uh, pretty obsolete. However, in the early 1970s, the parasite fighter concept was revived once again in the form of a Boeing study performed under a contract from the US Air Force investigating the use of a 747 jumbo jet as a flying aircraft carrier which finally brings us to the craft shown in this video. Contained within its fuselage would be a hangar of 10 so-called microfighters which would be able to launch from and return to the carrier. Not only this, but once reloaded and back on the mothership, they could be refueled, have their ordnance restocked and subsequently redeployed for further action. The big advantage here is that the 747 itself can move quite quickly, certainly much faster than a naval aircraft carrier, so that was kind of its big draw really. The military did consider using the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy, but unsurprisingly the Boeing engineers personally decided that the 747 was a better candidate <laughs> on the ground and had a more appropriate fuselage to facilitate building the onboard hangar. The argument was that it would lose too much of its cargo capability when modified for the project. But minor advantages aside, the 747 AAC was stupid and dumb. It makes far more sense to have the aircraft carry more fuel instead of a bunch of little planes inside it and have it refuel them mid-flight so that they can fly further. I mean, the advantage of being able to restock the aircraft and swap out the pilots and all that, it doesn't really seem to negate the enormous disadvantages of what we do today. And the K-135 entered service in 1957, this being the aircraft that we use for mid-air refueling, or at least one of them. Uh, this entered service in 1957, which was 12 years before the first 747 even flew. So refueling was possible way before this thing could ever be considered. So I guess the most fitting way to conclude this video is the way that you guys probably want it to be concluded. And that is by crashing it into the side of a mountain and watching those 2000 parts go a-flying.
But I do hope you enjoyed this uh, somewhat slightly different video than what I normally do. Um, somewhat little trip through time. Big thank you once again, or I guess congratulations, I'm not sure what the correct word would be here, to Zenon for having the patience to construct this monstrosity. As I said, there's a link to the Steam Workshop in the description, and on screen are some links to other things. So yeah, thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. And hopefully I'll see you on Wednesday, my dudes, for some roller coaster action shenanigans. Ah. <sighs>